Now it's time to listen to the invited speaker, the second invited speaker of the day, uh, Professor Mario De Caro from the University of Rome, Roma 3, Roma 3, and from Tufts University. Uh, so we I'm very happy to be here, even if I have to say, as our beloved chair has stressed, I feel there is a movie that describes my position now. It's a masterpiece by Charlie Chaplin that you may remember, especially if it, this works. I don't know if it doesn't work. It doesn't work. My <laughs> Arbitro. Okay, I will move the myself. Uh, anyway, the movie that I feel part of is this one, in which uh, Charlie Chaplin was seen as a chicken by the very hungry and very tired uh, uh, friend. So I think uh, you'll see me as the last obstacle between you and Dylan now, so I will try to be, to be try kind of um, quick. Uh, so let's start quickly with four ball climbs. No, it's the other one. Okay, it's going to be a little bit. Okay, let's go like this and let's go back. Let's go back to the chair. So, what do I do to change the screen? One, two, three. No, it's just that I launch it in a right way. Okay. This one? Oh, okay. Okay. Oh. Four ball claims. So the first one is that uh, naturalism is the best meta philosophy. So I won't argue much for that. I will keep this uh, for granted or something, some form of naturalism. Then uh, the best version of naturalism is not a non-reductive one. Uh, so a liberal form of naturalism, which is able to both account for the uh, scientific and the uh, manifest image of the world. The third one is that uh, this means to make just to do justice to the manifest and the scientific view of the world that you have to be realist about both. I don't feel, I'm, more specifically, I don't think there is a way of reducing the manifest image to the scientific image that does justice to the former. I would like that. And last one is. Uh, you, you need a form of pluralism in ontology, epistemology, and also in metaphilosophy, and uh, a theory of causation that has to be pluralistic as well. Uh, I will uh, mention one specific uh, case issue that already Sophia, uh, actually Sophia, mentioned, discussed in her, in her paper, that's uh, the free will issue. Um, as to this, let me say something general. I will be very general about the just preliminary parts. I think that uh, about the question, can we solve the free will issue, we can describe this situation. Uh, there are half of the people in the, in the philosophical market that try to say, of course we can solve the free will issue. But they divide in three groups. People that say, of course we can solve the free will issue, we do have free will. The existentialists and most continental philosophers don't think that the free will issue is really an issue. It's obvious that we have a freedom as Sartre says. The point is that this is the problem. We have freedom, what should we do with that? So this, they assume that we are free. That's the first point. The second, people that say, oh, of course we do not have free will. You know, freedom is incompatible with the scientific view of the world, so we don't have free will. And the third one is the mysterians. They say, of course we can solve the problem, in this sense. I'm oh, sorry, uh, uh, of course we cannot solve the problem, because it's, uh, we are not smart enough. Chomsky thinks that way, Van Wagen thinks that way, and McGinn, that is busy probably doing something else, is, thinks the same. Um, but I will talk about the others, half of the 
of the philosophical market here. People who, oh, let me say something first about, you know, people, of course, uh, people, many people in the neuroscience are very fast in saying that we don't have free will. There was Gazzanica, Michael Gazzanica, in Padua last week, and I, you know, I gave this paper, I asked about free will, and I was there, and some other people were there, and it was very fast, and said, oh, free will, oh, of course we don't have free will. Of course, that's a fine, it's part of the occur side. But I would like to talk about the others, people that think that free will is a problem. And actually, this is well described, but this, this is a quotation I love, and uh, Professor Larissa de Monticello will offer free dinner to the person who guesses who this says, says that. My uncle Toby honest man troubled uh, his brain the least with his abstruse thinking concerning liberty, necessity, and so forth. Harpoon, whose desperate and unquerable theory so many fine heads have been turned and cracked. Who's this? Stephen Stern. Stern. Okay, Paul. Paul, uh, okay. Paul said that? No, Tom? Tom? Oh, kind of. Ah, stern. So, okay, yeah, you said. So, you will offer yourself a dinner. That's it. <laughs> okay, that's Tristan Shandy. And I think it's a way of saying that it's a problem. It's a very difficult problem. And then, as you know, but why, and, oh, sorry, human can't disagree about everything on this issue. Agreed on the fact that it's an issue. They had proposals for solving it, but certainly they saw, saw it as an issue. So, I will discuss, let's call them, uh, these views that really take the problem, uh, the free will problem, as a very, very, very serious one. Uh, what's, uh, I think the best way of nowadays of putting this problem at the center of the scene is asking this question, can we give a satisfying account of, the, of free will in a naturalistic framework? That seems to be, to me, the most interesting uh, way of putting it. And two possible ways of framing the problem in a naturalistic context, uh, depending on what form of naturalism you accept, either a scientific form of naturalism or a liberal form of naturalism. And this is, these are very different and produce, produce very different answers. So uh, this is a constraint for the Shandian views. So let's go. Shandian views are pro views, philosophical views that take the problem seriously, the free will problem seriously. So I think that this is what I think a serious philosophical view of free will should, uh, should, should obtain, should account for the both views of the world. So the scientific and the agential world should be accounted seriously. Uh, and this is the only way you satisfyingly account for free will. So we don't want free will disconnected from the scientific view of the world, but we don't want the scientific view of the world taking it over accounts, you know, delaying everything that is connected with freedom. That's my view. Uh, that, uh, how I see the, the, the possible solution, where the solution of the problem should be located. Uh, and this is how uh, the other part of the, at least the interesting part of the, the people who discuss it seriously, the problem. Uh, so there are unity views, unity views that are produced by scientific naturalists. There is kind of a unit, unit, uh, unitarian view of the world and of knowledge, and, and this can give us the answer to the frivolous issue. And then there are duality views that are produced by duality or plurality views that are produced by uh, liberal naturalist philosophers that have a more nuanced solution to the free will issue, not a unitarian monistic one. Okay, so what is scientific naturalism? Briefly, um, is the idea uh, is based on three main uh, principles. The first one is ontological. Substantially, our ontology should be the same as the natural sciences. Um, it, um, this is a view that, for example, Pettit describes that way. There are only natural things, only natural particulars, and only natural properties, where natural means, in the sense of the natural sciences, the ontology of the natural sciences. And then, also, um, there is an epistemological principle that um, defines scientific naturalism, the idea that all forms of knowledge are either scientific or reducible to scientific forms of knowledge, at least in principle, or are just illegitimate. And this is what, for example, Blackburn says, naturalism is characterized by the idea that ultimately nothing receives an explanation by the methods characteristic of the natural sciences. So 
if something is an explanation, potentially it's a scientific explanation. And then finally, there is a metaphilosophical corollary according to which substantial philosophy is with, continuous with science. And, and this is a famous quotation by Twine, where he says that philosophy should be conceived as a part of one's system of the world, continue with the rest of science. So philosophy belongs to the same uh, system of science. Well, uh, of course, uh, there are at least, there are many, but at least two problems with this view. And the first one, no, sorry. <laughs> the first one is, which science is relevant for this view? Uh, present day science or in principle science? Only physics or physics and biology, if biology is not reducible to physics? Professor Mordach is thinking. No, no, you distract me. So, five, five. Okay, now it's much better. Um, uh, so the first point is, which science are we talking about? Uh, only physics, physics and biology, what about the social science? All these are controversial points. But still, uh, if you are a liberal naturalist, you will, uh, sorry, a scientific naturalist, who, you would say that ontology, epistemology, and philosophy are defined by what you think science is. And the second one, the biggest problem, is the placement problem. This is uh, a definition that um, David McCartan and I have used some time, but I think also Hugh Price uses it. So the idea is, uh, the problem with this form of natural, reductive natural, scientific natural, is uh, Professor Mortacci has already done that. <laughs> you see the sound, that's interesting. I, I, I got that the sound okay. is going bad. Um, so the problem is, with this form of scientific or reductive naturalism, where do you locate all the properties that are in prima facie, don't, don't belong to the natural world. So normative, intentional, modal, phenomenological, moral, abstract properties, and first personal properties in the sense that Lynn Baker is stressing. So where do you put uh, those? Um, and so uh, the answer by the scientific naturalists is generally a unitary explanation of reality uh, in the light of, of scientific knowledge. The risk, of course, is that you just lose uh, uh, the essential perspective here, the probably features of the world that you would like to, to explain. And the, and the same is true for the free will problem. And here are the three typical options. The first one is a reductionist. Uh, so let's say what is worth wanting, this is Dan Dennett's phrase in the idea of free will by placing it in the scientific scenario. So what is worth wanting according to, to that in, in the idea of free will can be uh, um, accommodated in the scientific view of the world. The second is an eliminationist view. An example is Gazzanica or Harris or Der Perbo. So nothing is worth wanting in the idea of free will. Okay, let's forget it. And the third one is Mysterianism, uh, hmm. Chomsky or, or Benningwagen or, or uh, McGee will never know the solution because we are not smart enough. Benningwagen is very good at that because he says, you know, I don't, I don't know if, uh, he says, I don't think we will we'll ever solve it. And the explanation that he cannot solve it. So this <laughs> proves it by generalization that no human being ever will be able to solve it. That's, uh, okay, that's his view. Um, now, the liberal uh, naturalist view for which I sympathize. And the, uh, first of all, uh, it's, a, it's a good quotation of idea by Mac McDowell that says, that, you know, scientific naturalism, so the idea that nature has to be identified with the subject of the natural sciences, and there is nothing else that, that nature, <coughs> this is a misconception of the intellectual obligation of naturalism. So he, McDowell says that there is much more in nature than what the natural sciences tell us about. And these are some people that would agree with that and think also it can be set, put in this list. And uh, even if she defends a near naturalist because she's the only difference from the other forms of liberal naturalism that Lynn is neutral about uh, the possibility of supernaturalism. But beside that, I think she's a, a, a classic liberal naturalism. Liberal naturalist. Um, so here are the three principles liberalized uh, that we have seen for scientific naturalists. The first one is the idea that we have reason to think that there are entities that are not reducible to the entities 
that science explains, but I'm not supernatural either. Um, then, epistemology, that we have reason to think that there are ways of knowing that are not reducible to the empirical forms of knowledge. A priori reasoning, first hand, conceptual analysis, artistic understanding. I don't mention intuition because Lynn says that's supernatural. I don't agree with that, but I didn't mention it to our travels with Lynn. And, uh, and the last one is metaphilosophy. And of course, here, a liberal naturalist uh, granted there are cases in which philosophy is continued with science. There are many interesting studies on in, in uh, neuroethics or in philosophy of cognitive science or many other um, ethics, but not all philosophical fields or problems, I think, should be solved with the um, scientific methods. I think there is more to philosophy than just science. Anyway, these are the, uh, the principles of liberal naturalism. And, uh, um, the typical solution to a philosophical problem that can be offered from this point of view, the point of view of liberal naturalism, has a form of duality, uh, which is supposed to be compatible with the science, differently from duality, Cartesian dualism is supposed to be compatible with the scientific worldview. That's the idea. And look, um, of course the main problem here is to show that these forms of duality are compatible with what science tells us about the world. But it should always be remembered that we already accept some forms of duality. Most of us. Most of us accept the idea, for example, that abstract entities exist that are not, of course, part of the uh, uh, ontology of the sciences. But even Squine, he says that he had to accept, uh, he was a Platonist with uh, as to philosophy of mathematics. Because science, you know, um, of course, there are, science uses mathematics and we accept the idea that we have to accept the ontology of science. We have to accept also the existence of sets of numbers. Even if they are not part of the scientific ontology, they are uh, uh, part of the scientific method. So we should accept our explanations. We should accept this, this, uh, this kind of entity. So we all, all already accept it from a duality as to existence. Natural, there are few natural, um, scientific naturalists that are consistent here. One is Hartree-Field, that tries to eliminate abstract entities. Another one is Penelope Medi, that tries to have this form of empirical Platonism. But all the others are inconsistent. It's, they say that they only accept the uh, ontology of the natural sciences. It's not true. Um, and finally, let's go back to, to free will then. The problem is, can we formulate a form of dualism, or pluralism, or duality that is acceptable from a scientific point of view and is respectful for our intuitions about free will? That's my challenge. So, uh, this is a quotation by Tim O'Connor that is the main agent causalist. Um, I will criticize Tim. Um, and, uh, yeah, um, briefly, let's read this. I will criticize this because I think that's not what we should look for. Having the properties that subserve an agent causal capacity doesn't produce an effect. Rather, it enables the agent to determine an effect within a circumscribed range. Whether, when, and how such capacity will be exercised is freely determined by the agent. That's a quotation by Tim O'Connor, and I think the objections that can be moved against this, raised against this view, are classically four. Um, it explains obscuring per obscurius. So, because this agential capacity is really something mysterious because we see causation around the world but we don't see um, event causation but what is this agent causation that is ontologically different from event causation that's the idea if you only have this very specific kind of uh, causation then second is ad hoc it's a form of you know um, causation you assume just to solve the free will issue um, it's a, a, a empirically implausible because um, Tim wants to root this form of this solution of the free will problem in physics, but he has to appeal to bizarre interpretation of quantum mechanics or physics like the one offered by Prigozhin at some point as a solution of this kind of consciousness and free will. And this is empirically unstable. And the last one is uh, the so-called mind object objection can be reformulated. The mind objection is simply the one that Hume made so stated so clearly. If there is indeterminism, that is assumed by, uh, presupposed by, by uh, Tim O'Connor, if there is indeterminism, 
whatever what you can uh, get is randomness or chaos. Uh, oh, sorry, randomness or uh, just the pure chance. You don't get control, so you lose control, and this is so you lose free will. So for all of these reasons, I don't think that agent causation, as is tra traditionally stated, is very promising. I want something different. I will try to discuss briefly three duality views and propose a fourth one. So these are different from regular agent causation. I use a, an article, a famous article by Dana Nelkin, published some years ago in J. Phil. And uh, she, she mentions three forms of duality view that I will discuss. The first one is, the, she called it the two worlds view, the Kantian view, let's call it. The second one is the two aspects view, so like Spinoza and Davidson. And the third one is the two standpoints view that, that she attributes to Strozen. She discusses these three and criticizes them. And she, her conclusion is that uh, there is no duality view that, that is really uh, uh, practicable and feasible. And I think she, sometimes she does it correctly, sometimes she's not. Uh, her criticism is not wrong, but anyway, I will propose another, at the end, a fourth version. So let's see the two worlds, two worlds view. That's the Kantian view, right? She says, reason leads us to two beliefs about two different subjects of our worlds. That Kantian mind value it is. Uh, for example, our belief that we are free and our actions undetermined is a belief about our normal, noumenal selves, and our belief that our actions are determined is a belief about our phenomenal selves. So this is the classic Kantian distinction. And uh, from this point of view, these two beliefs have, she says, non-contradictory contents. This is what also Kant says, of course. So one can be rational in accepting both. Uh, uh, but I think, uh, and she criticizes the idea of noumena, of the noumena, and I think, anyway, for our standard, this is too liberal. There are different things we can move, even if I think there is something important in Kant's, in, in Kant's uh, insight. But the point of differentiating between noumena and phenomena has problems. For example, the conclusion, typical conclusion of Kantianism, not all Kantians, but many Kantians, is that they are anti-realist. Uh, uh, have an anti-realist attitude towards the natural sciences because uh, natural sciences only concern the phenomena, so appearances, not the re what, what is real, really out there. So there, there are many complications here, but most uh, Kantians, including the logical positivists, tend to be anti-realist about science. And I think uh, now, for reasons I cannot address here, uh, scientific realism uh, recommends itself. So I'm not happy with this. Um, let's go to the second one. Let's say it's Spinoza Davidson view. Uh, she writes, our beliefs are about, the, she describes this view. Our beliefs are about the same world and about the same objects. But one of our beliefs is about ourselves and our actions considered in one aspect or under one description, while another is about ourselves and our actions considered in a different aspect or under a different description. Um, and then she, uh, so she says, here you can have two beliefs, you can hold two beliefs that, you know, prima facie are contradictory, but uh, they are not real because they talk about different aspects of the world. Uh, so you can be rationally in holding both. Davidson, for example, right? You can say, describe uh, uh, um, our Mr. Chair, I like that. Mr. Chair, I like. Mr. Chair, Mr. Chair saying, uh, but when he talks, I can describe uh, this action from an intentional point of view, or I can describe it from a physiological point of view. Um, and they can, you can have different beliefs here about what happened, but they are not contradictory because they, you know, different descriptions or different aspects um, are, are in, in involved. So she, what Nelkin says here is, is it a whole, uh, against Davidson mostly, it does often be noted that if an event is determined, then it is determined no matter how it is described. That's, we described that before. And she adds, for this reason, Davidson version fails to provide a reconciliation of reaction understood as undetermined action with determinism. So, Davidson, according to her, and Spinoza are unsatisfying because you cannot say free will, uh, because, you know, this is uh, uh, described in a physical 
vocabulary or in a, with physical descriptions, it, a causal uh, relations are all deterministic, are always deterministic, so there is no space for freedom. Now, this is very puzzling and very wrong. First of all, Davidson is a compatibilist, is not a libertarian, so he doesn't want to uh, indeterminism, he's happy with determinism. But still, as you, I think uh, most of us know, uh, the Davidson's two aspects view that is directly inspired by Spinoza does face a big problem, that is the idea that uh, uh, his view is a form of epiphenomenalism. Uh, so the idea that the mental does not have any causal power, because all causal power, as we said before, depends on the fact that there are physical properties at stake. So only when it's uh, all causal uh, relations it is an uh, instantiated law of nature that connects physical properties or physical events in Davidson's case. So everything is up to the physical. Mental properties or features of the world don't add anything. So when you describe a, a, an event in a physical terms, this is only uh, a physical description and travesty. The causal role is all, uh, only um, evident when you describe something in physical terms. So this means that uh, this doesn't really work, not because it uh, is, uh, you know, doesn't make libertarianism possible, but simply because he can't delay any possibility of freedom because there is no agent anymore. There is no mental life anymore. There is no causal power of the mental, mental events. Davidson would agree with Klein when he said, I subscribe to compatibilism as much as, it, and so I believe in freedom as much as, you know, our mental properties or events are part of a causal chain that ends up in inaction. But here there are no men, uh, mental, no mental states is even ever, ever part of a causal chain. Because mental events or properties are causally inefficacious in that sense view. So the point is that this view is too liberal, and it's not liberal enough, sorry. It's not liberal enough because reduces all form of causation to physical causation. In this, in this way, it really deletes, cancels freedom from the, from the natural world. Let's look at the third one. Oh, um, yes, this is because this view tries to force freedom in the nomological causal network to which it does not belong. That's why it doesn't work. So let's try something different. This is the third view that Nell can Nelkin criticizes, but I think it's a little more promising, even if I will say something different eventually. It's called the two standpoints view, and this is connected with the Strozo. Uh, she says, Nelkin says, there is nothing problematic in believing both that our actions are free and so undetermined, and that our actions are determined and so not free, because each of our beliefs held from different standpoints. This is the way she thinks that uh, uh, Strozen presented his famous view that was um, present, mentioned by Sophia already. In other words, although reason commits us to contradictory beliefs, there need not be to be uh, any rationality as a, res as a result, as long as each belief is held from a distinct standpoint. And then she gives a very puzzling example. She says, uh, so we can be rational, even if we have contradictory belief, we are not free, we are free, because we've all done from a different standpoint. And her example is this. We can believe P and desiring not P. And this is rational. But this is, I don't know why she's saying that. That's uh, exactly what the desire is. You desire something that you don't believe is true already. And so, of course, this is not contradictory. But we are talking in this case, in the case of will, we are talking about beliefs, not beliefs and desires. So holding a contradiction is not very promising at all. It's not a fair way of presenting that view anyway. And so I wouldn't describe that view as, uh, uh, you know, starting with a contradiction and say that you can have hold a contradiction in a rational way. I don't think that's true. But also, I don't think it's fair towards Strozone. Strozone is not a cognitivist about ethics. Is an emotivist or uh, sentimentalist, depending on how you describe him. But so he doesn't think that what matters about morality here is uh, in what statements or sentences that we all believe we hold. 
is uh, an emotion, a feeling we prove towards the others, reactive attitudes. So it said, really, there is no contradiction because there is no belief about uh, morality here. It's more an attitude that we have. Um, still, I don't, I don't find Strozen very promising just because it's not realist about uh, morality. I want to, as I said, I think it's more promising to be a realist both about science and about the agential world. I'm not satisfied for several reasons with well, Strozen's view because it's, uh, you know, it just says, oh, even if we knew that the term is true uh, and we were libertarians, uh, we wouldn't give up freedom. That's his uh, argument. We wouldn't be able to give up freedom. And I think that's not enough. We want more uh, from a theory of freedom. Um, and so I will describe briefly a fourth kind of duality, duality view, which does not commit us to any of the following that are instead the features of the three duality views that Nelkin criticizes. This view that I'm going to present in three seconds doesn't commit us to the two worlds view like Kant, so no woman of phenomena, does not commit us to the idea that freedom and necessitation are two different aspects of the same reality, because I don't think this is very promising, and the idea that we can rationally, doesn't commit us to the idea that we can rationally hold contradictory beliefs, as according to Nelke, as Strozen and the other, some other people think when they defend this view. I think that's crazy anyway, but I think what I'm saying now is not, uh, that doesn't commit us to any of this. So let's call it the pluralistic view. It's more a framework than a detailed explanation, of course. So um, I think this view is describing or uh, actually getting the spirit of proposals by Patram, Cosgar, John McDowell, Stephen White, Akil Bigrami, perhaps Lee, and Baker. Um, and I think uh, all these people, if I understand them, would um, claim that there are two different perspectives that make reality intelligible for us. Not not sentiments like construction, just two perspectives. The scientific perspective, which uses causal and nomological concepts, and the agential perspective, which uses normative concepts. Now, the point is, what is the relationship between these two, right? And the relationship, I think, has to be uh, central to these two notions that I need to understood, understood clearly. Normativity and causality. That's the crucial point. So. Uh, Let's call it double intelligibility view or pluralistic view, I'm undecided yet, still, but uh, what is crucial in order to attribute freedom to an agent is two ideas. The first is that this agent is able to respond adequately to normative reasons concerning the action she has performed or will perform, and this is not enough. Some people say this is not enough. I don't think it's enough. You only have to say that she has some causal powers that are not reducible to normological causation, but not supernatural either. I, many people now, the new compatibilists stress the first uh, point, of like me mm, or uh, Watson or uh, Dennett, but I think you also need this one, because otherwise you lose freedom, really. Uh, so, but this is different from the usual agent causation view, I don't think it's in contradiction with the scientific view of the world, and also works better because I don't think, I think this is more acceptable. Let's see better what I mean. I'm oh, sorry. Uh, no, this already seen. Okay, almost done. Uh, okay, I think the first point is that you need conceptual pluralism, uh, and uh, this is something we already accept. So for example, uh, I think uh, that uh, many people would accept the idea that there is a, a table here, a real table, besides the table described by science. You know, according to science, this is not here. It's empty. It's 99.99% emptiness, more than 99%, more. Uh, because this is what microphysics tells us. And so some people, including Eddington and perhaps some physicalists nowadays, including probably Quine, would say that in some sense, from an ontological point of view, this is not here. What is here is only atoms. I don't think this is acceptable. I think most of us would say that the, this table is as real as the physical one. So we have, in some sense, different levels of reality. And this is a form of conceptual pluralism. Uh, and this concept of the table is not reducible to the uh, atomic one. Otherwise, you would lose the table. 
If you try to reduce this to the, the empty one, that is the one that is mentioned and discussed by microphysics, I don't think you go very far. Um, so you need both. Depending on what interest you have, you need both tables. Um, and this is, I think, this kind of conceptual pluralism also applies to human beings. That's what we want. And this is the Kantian, Kantian uh, insight. Okay, we are, but it's a naturalized Kantian insight. We are at the same time a, uh, agents and natural entities who respond to reasons. These are the two ways that we can look at each other uh, at the same time. And this is essential. And both views are uh, uh, necessary. Okay. Um, and then I think we also need causal pluralism. And this comes from pragmatism, especially from Patam. Uh, but I mean, there are defense of causal pluralism around. When we attribute responsibilities to someone for an action uh, she has performed, we look for the relevant causes of that action. Uh, depending on what question we ask or what interest we have, there are different possible answers. Neither, none of these answers is the answer to why something happened. It depends on what your interest is in asking why this happened. Um, uh, and I think, for example, if I ask uh, why Andrea is yawning now, because, or I could say, because my talk is incredibly boring, or because it's tired, and uh, anyway, these are uh, cases, uh, good possible good answers, but what is important here that for our interest, we are interested in the singular causation. There is, doesn't seem to be any interesting law that we would explain what Andrea is doing in terms of universal laws, or what Roberta is doing in terms of universal laws. I mean, it seems universal, I think one is yawning here. But um, I don't think that it's a universal law. It's, these are cases of singular causation when we ask in questions in terms of intentional reasons or explanations that of uh, actions. Um, and what the point is this, that at most singular position generates over-determination, not a phenomenalism. You remember what happened with Davidson. Davidson had this idea. Each um, causal relation is actually a physical causal relation and travesty. Okay? So I can say, Andrea wants really to eat now. He wants to go out and eat. But this is only a way of saying something that could be said better using the vocabulary of physics in principle. And I think this is uh, science fiction. I don't think this is, we don't have any idea if this is possible, and this is not what is relevant here. Uh, we want to know why Andrea is, in uh, what he wants to do, why he wants to go out, why he wants to eat. Not what, what you know, uh, a scientist who knew all the state of the universe now would say about it. Um, so at most we have over determination of And Andrea behavior, but we don't have epiphenomenalism because there is no reduction of the cause upper causal level to the lower causal level, and I think this is more or less what was discussed before. Um, so I think the ch danger of epiphenomenalism is therefore avoided because this form of causal pluralism says that there are different causal levels. The, that are all legitimate depending on what your interests are, but there is no ontological grounding or primacy of the lower level uh, on, the, on the higher level. Um, so, some final remarks. Uh, I think uh, this could be explained, perhaps is compatible at least, uh, with the idea that the manifest image is globally supervening uh, on, on this scientific image of the world. So I think maybe it seems plausible that two identical, physically identical world, worlds, or physically biologically identical worlds, if biology is not reducible to physics, I'm neutral about that, uh, these two worlds would be, have the same manifest image properties. Uh, that's at least is possible. Even if some people deny that, like Bill Grammy, for example, but that's uh, I'm neutral about that. Uh, I think that this is a form of compatibilism, really. It doesn't need indeterminism. It's compatible with both determinism and indeterminism because what really matters here is not what is the structure of the universe, if the universe is deterministic or indeterministic, but only that there are relevant causal chains 
that explain intentionally why people do some things. And then uh, I think that by appealing to conceptual and causal pluralism, this kind of pluralistic or double intelligibility view does justice to both the manifested and scientific image. And, uh, and I think both images rule in their respective dominions if we accept this form of pluralism, both conceptual and causal. So there is no primacy of the one over the other. For, to put it differently, for uh, Husserl in uh, crisis, there was a primacy of the, uh, what we can call the manifest image, whereas for Sellers, there was a pri primacy of the scientific image. I think these are, were two gigantic efforts, great efforts to solve the problem that Kant poses, so how to reconcile the two views, but I think we should get the intuition by Kant and stay in the middle, say what images. There is no primacy of one over the other. And uh, with this, I stop. Thank you very much. Me today. Yeah, that's what I wanted to do. So, okay, we. Okay. Official, official, <laughs> official puzzle. Okay, so we, we do have time for discussion now. Yeah. Questions? Ah, yes, okay. Oh, thank you very much. Of course, I uh, almost entirely agree with you, but I'm not too sure about conceptual pluralism. That sounds too weak to me. Mm -hmm. It sounds like just a dis two description view, uh, double description view, um, that you just sort of claim is really an ontological view. Um, but it doesn't, it just seems too weak. In fact, that would uh, um, Putnam, for example, well, but there are a whole lot of people today who have given up on metaphysics altogether because they think of metaphysics as being abstruse, abstract, um, talking about essences and horrible things that are not empirical. Um, uh, and I don't want to give up on metaphysics. I want to say that if we have to think, if, we, if it's something that's essential to our purposes and all the things you agree with, um, then we ought to say it's real, and we ought to say in metaphysics it's ontologically real. Um, and it's not just a concept, it's not just conceptual. Okay, but that's a very good point, Lynn. And actually I agree with you, but surprisingly enough, also Hillary would agree with you, because it's back to metaphysics. Oh, good uh, for him. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, it's a, there is a paper in the anthology I edited two years ago, and I'll give it to you, which it says metaphysics is personal fact. It's still against realist metaphysics, the idea that there is one unique view of the world, the, the ontology. But I would agree with you, where uh, conceptual pluralism here means that this concept refers to properties out there, in this sense. So there is a, a hierarchy of properties, so I would agree. Perhaps the name is, okay, suggested that. So we agree on that. Okay, over there, and then Michele. Uh, thank you very much, I enjoyed that paper. Uh, I'm a supporter of conceptual pluralism. Anna Putnam and others, and Husserl, I think, too, actually. But I think that you still are, perhaps you can elaborate on this, assuming uh, a one world view in terms of the causal uh, and world of the physical, as it were, and that perhaps there are different. Your, your multiple descriptions are between a physical description and then maybe a cultural description or an intentional description or something like that. But there may be irreducibly many forms of description. I'm thinking of the poem by Stevie Smith, she says, not waving but drowning, you know, somebody out at sea doing this. Uh, physically, there's a description of this. Uh, even after they drowned, you know, maybe they were, they were waving, but they drowned anyway, you know. <coughs> um, we don't know. It, it, the description is intentional if we want to understand it as waving or drowning. There's nothing in the physical world that will determine it. You know, so that, that we do, there are, there are, and this is true of many things in the law, for example, the difference between murder and accidental homicide. Same thing happens, it's a matter of intention. Yeah. You know, so, but 
unless you're counting the intention as a part of the physical world, which is a kind of reductive form of naturalism, you're just going to have to have uh, plural descriptions that are not reducible to each other. But perhaps there are, you know, there may be several descriptions at, the, at what I would call the, the intentional level. There may be just competing descriptions. So, so you would say something like that you have quine um, sub, under the termination of theories by evidence. Yes. So that's a particular case, right? Uh, actually, Link convinced me here uh, to give up even the idea that necessarily uh, every causal relation in Eastern shape uh, a physical relation. Right. So, so it may be that I'm neutral of that, but I grant the possibility that um, there are forms of intentional causation that are not exemplified. They don't exemplify physical causation. So, for example, if emergentism is true, what you're saying doesn't really there is not the risk of the situation you say, because, right? The, co the real cause is that the mental ones. Yeah, so uh, I think that this is the problem with the various versions of, of why people are still uh, attached to naturalism. There has to be some assumption that the physical explanation in some sense is priority. You were talking about this earlier. Whereas I think if you just abandon that, uh, you, you know, you, why should you, why should you yeah. think that? That, that's a, a, a good point, and I think, yes, uh, Lane convinced me to, that that was a little... Actually, the same happened for Davidson. All the troubles with Davidson come from his, you know, believing that all, every causal uh, relation exemplifies a law, a physical law of nature, because then everything is lost there. Um, actually, Max Planck said something interesting. He says, about the causal closure of the physical world, he says, okay, that's a, a methodological uh, step that we make, but who knows about the real world? People tend to forget that. That's it. you know why should we? Why should this be the parameter of ontology? Who knows about that? It's a very, a very scientific move. Okay, thank you. I'm very good. Agree. Okay. I agree. <laughs> That's Michele. a good, a good parameter for truth for you, right? <laughs> Michele Francesco. Yes, so thank you for the talk. It's really very interesting. I agree. And the overall picture, just a couple of questions. The, the first is more, is a, a sort of stylistic observation. I don't like, uh, I, I mean, I, yes, I don't like very much the, the label uh, scientific naturalism that you use, uh, you, you, you understand why you use this, uh, this label, but in a sense it uh, suggests that sci the scientific uh, the yeah. scientific worldview is not pluralistic. On the contrary, uh, science is deeply pluralistic. Even theoretical physics is not a unitary field yeah. because, yeah. as you will know, uh, quantum mechanics and general relativity theory uh, are at odds, and, and there are, you mentioned, social sciences. And as uh, Nancy Caltrai says, science looks not much like a patchwork, not a requirement. Mean, so I, is it, I don't know. Which level? Uh, no, could be, no, okay, if I drop you, I agree with you. Um, I think Lina agrees also as well. I mean, it's granting too much to the reductive physics. Yeah, yeah, so a better term, sometimes I use it, I should use it more. Strict naturalism or reductive naturalism. Yeah. Reductive, I'm not entirely happy because uh, sometimes they are eliminationists. So perhaps strict naturalism would be better. Yeah. I agree with that. And the second question probably is more uh, difficult. I mean, uh, I think that the real problem with pluralistic approaches to causality are in individual cases in which we, you find a competition between uh, uh, two kinds of explanations. Uh, even an example from neuroscience, uh, let, let's take the example of uh, uh, deep brain stimulation. You know, you send uh, high frequency impulses in the subcortical part of the brain. And as a result, you have a sort of therapy of major depression. Depression is described and individuated at the, at the personal level, uh, but you have a very strong physical, uh, electrical and chemical explanation of what's going on. What's going on. So this is the, the sort of uh, uh, problematic situation in which uh, you, sometimes you, you have, it's, it's not so easy to say there are different levels of explanation. I like you know, today. Yeah, I try to defend the idea of different levels of explanation because of the interaction and between the two levels. So 
I would like to know what yeah. is your attitude. Uh, and, and, and in this case, there is a problem because, uh, in, uh, in, of course, we always explain singular cases, but uh, as a methodological result, in, in, for example, in a neuroscientific uh, en enterprise, you have to, uh, re uh, um, to uh, repeat the experiment with different subjects. So there is some, also something general we are looking for. So, Sure, but I think uh, even, uh, let's take the case of conflict of possible causal factors in the, no, both the physical level, right? right? Explain why someone did something stupid on Saturday night, like driving too fast, drunk. You can have, you know, that was because he decided to drink, he decided to, you know, his, his friends push him, or his culture was such. He had some, seen that movie one month. All these are com competing in some sense. Uh, explanations. What is important here is that um, the criteria are pragmatic for what you want to know. In that case, it seems to me that we have strong evidence that the physical explanation is better than others. So I'm not, not an object to that. In, in case you have that kind of evidence, it seems to me that there is no a priori reason to say, oh no, that's impossible because there is such a strong divide. But I would, what I doubt is this a priori uh, faith that uh, physicalists have that there is always a physical explanation of everything that happens. That, I think, to me, yes, seems a dream. Yes, but I, I am prepared to this kind of answer, uh, but let's imagine, and this is not an imagination, it's a fact, let's imagine that, well, we decided that the brain level, in this case, is the best explanation. So, 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 sorry, the brain level. Okay. But in this case, uh, we uh, may miss another part of the truth. For example, we may have a genetic disposition to depression, that only in a certain environmental and social situation, you know, and so uh, we find uh, so there is a dialectical, uh, and so it's, uh, it is a continuous mixture of levels, and we change level continuously in the real scientific practice. So, uh, so the question is, levels shouldn't be considered as independent from each other, but interacting, strongly interacting. Yeah, of course, think about this. This is an example again by Patton, I think, or by me, one of the two. <laughs> I don't remember. And, uh, a person yeah, has a stroke, a person has a stroke, right? And we ask why. And so you can ask why, but well, the answer depends exactly on what interest you have in asking this question. If you are the, you know, the, the partner of that person who say, oh, he had the strike because I cooked this incredible dinner last night and he, he hated too much and that's my fault and so it's my responsibility. But if you are a physiologist, you don't care about that. You only care about the physiological explanation. If you are the person who, you know, made the insurance for them, you probably want to say, oh, he didn't take his pills. That's a better explanation for you. What is the explanation? There is no answer. I don't think there is a clear answer to that question. It depends on the interest. It's, as Patton and I think there is really correct. The notion of a, um, explanation is, uh, context relative, but so is the notion of causation. He says, he quotes how John Heldin on that, there are as many causes as becauses, depends what questions you ask. Alan McKay and then Roberta. Okay. Um, here, here. Uh, here. Um, first of all, just can I say, uh, in your last slide, why not substitute constitution for global supervenience? They're both metaphysical ideas, and you could perhaps choose uh, how you wish to interpret them ontologically mm -hmm. according to your. You know, although uh, I, uh, Linda is certainly better than me on this, but supervenience as such is weaker because supervenience only says there is covariation. Mm. In itself, supervenience doesn't talk about dependence. Mm. Uh, of course, the Constitution yeah, does. So I'm not sure that. Everything in the mental world, for example, is constituted that kind of. Okay. So I prefer to be vague here. Yeah. Constitution is the vaguest notion. It is. It, it, sense, it, it, doesn't, the benefits, it right? doesn't actually explain anything. Uh, yeah, but it doesn't explain that. Constraints things because yeah. well, given two physically identical world, you cannot yeah. have some different properties, okay. some two mental properties. So. Okay. Well, just the other question. Um, you describe causation. Uh, physical causation and what we were talking about earlier, ID causation. I mean, is, is there not, um, given 
the substance of your talk, is there not actually a case for saying that those are two completely different things? You know, that we use we use the word causation. Well, I suppose it, it, it's, it's a bit like the quote from Putnam, Putnam you just gave. Uh, would it not help our understanding if we re regarded them as um, as quite different? Again, it depends what your interests are. Your interest is, mm. so if you're writing a dictionary and uh, you have to define cause, all these forms would be uh, under the same entry uh, because they answer the question why. Then if you want to say, if you want to define causation as uh, a kind of relation that exemplifies laws of nature, certainly they are different things. Mm -hmm. So again, it depends. What do you mean? As explanatory factors, I think we they belong to the same family, but perhaps they are so different. So it depends. Okay. Okay. Well, but just very finally, uh, the remark about Planck and how can we know about the real world? That that was the point I was trying to make. That the the contrast is not with with fundamental quantum physics. It's with the the behavior of the world with which are, we are quite familiar <coughs> from day to day, and we know that things don't get from one place to another like going through the space in between. We know that uh, I can't uh, bend spoons, if you remember your oh, of there, right. I So That's a very interesting, but as you know, there are very respected philosophers of science that think, for example, that laws of nature don't exist at all, mm -hmm. or they only work in labs, because they are also full of Chetavis Paribus clauses or, you know, that, I mean, they are idealization. So I, here, again, I kind of be, I would be like to be prudent, even if I see your point, there are constraints that the physical world put on us, absolutely. Thank you. Okay. Roberta? Thanks, and very much for this very, so, um, systematic uh, talk. Um, just a small question about the levels. Uh, maybe it's like uh, uh, Lynn's question, I'm not sure. But take the most classical example, Socrates going to the court of justice. You see, now it depends on what you're interested in, uh, uh, what, what the sense, the meaning of your uh, asking why. Okay, but then are you uh, each time uh, explaining different things or the same one. That's the problem. I'm not sure that I have understood your answer to that problem. It's, I mean, the, because I, what I call the conceptual, uh, conceptual plural is that, of course, as, a, as right. it was stressing also an ontological right. uh, correspondent here. It, I mean, if I describe, for example, Andreas uh, being angry because he wants to go home and eat now, and instead of, you know, listening to us, um, I could describe him in intentional terms, or I could describe him what happens from physiological terms. I'm describing different things. Certainly, here I can describe his intentional state, or I can describe his, his uh, 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 the way his body works. So, but again, it depends. If you want, I think it again depends on your interests. If you okay, but the point is, no, are I you explaining this? parts of the same thing, of the same, so to speak, whole, or are you describing uh, constituted and constituting things? I mean, which is your ontology? Because, I mean, you have to take a decision. No, no, I know I have to take a decision, um, even if it's too late to make, this, to make decisions now, but um, what I think is, uh, if you're an emergent, is in some sense there is one world there, but it's one sense that is weak, or is, or is, regard to people that think that there is only one basic level, right? So there are different levels of things. Uh, there is one world in a very weak sense, but it's composed of different things, as Link was saying. So uh, depends on the kind of explanation. Sometimes you're describing the same things from different points of view, but sometimes you're really describing different properties, different features of the world. Elisabetta. <coughs> Uh, yes, it's a point of clarification. Uh, uh, I would like to know whether your uh, um, whether the fourth uh, solution, uh, uh, the one we uh, which you favor, um, 
is uh, liberal enough, uh, because uh, this was the criticism that you raised uh, against the other three uh, yeah, no, was they liberal. weren't uh, liberal enough, and so no, Kant was too liberal. So too okay, liberal. okay, and so yours is uh, uh, not too liberal, uh, and uh, so it's liberal at uh, the right point. Uh, okay, okay, and uh, uh, <laughs> okay, and there, there is a uh, you know this sort of dilemma that uh, some people raise: uh, uh, if it is uh, too liberal, it cannot be naturalist, yeah. and yeah. if it is. Uh, and in which sense, uh, maybe it's to, to be the question, but in which sense uh, your amount of uh, liberalism uh, saved you from yeah. uh, anti-naturalism? For anti-naturalism? Okay, because uh, uh, there are naturalistic constraints. There are naturalistic constraints. Uh, uh, what I said, that all these forms of, from an ontological and epistemological point of view, I don't accept uh, supernatural uh, and explanations. explanation. So, and I discussed this with Alberto in that in article in which I discussed this exactly this dilemma that was posed to us by Ram Neda that says, oh, how can you be a liberal and naturalist at the same time? And the point that he had a very strict idea of what nature is. So if you have a broader idea, you can be liberal. He thinks that at some point he has this passage raising the doubt you were raising. He says, uh, let's assume that we can naturalize digestion uh, reasoning, I don't remember what else. So he puts this in this class, right? And then he asks, in what sense then you can be uh, the liberal if you grant these points? I don't grant these points that, <laughs> that uh, you know, digestion is like reasoning. I mean, I want to see more evidence that, uh, you know, this phrase that they can be naturalized. So in this sense, I'm more liberal than him, but I don't accept natural entities in my ontology, so I don't, I'm not super natural. Uh, a very brief question. You said uh, I avoid um, epiphenomenalism, but um, there is, I think, a danger of overdetermination. Uh, my question is simply, are you prepared to admit a sort of ubiquitous and, and systematic sort of overdetermination, over which is, I think... Yeah, it depends. Uh, so the good question was, are this... Uh, it's a point if all these causes belong to a family. In some sense, physical determination, physical causation is one thing. And I open to the idea that this is not a, a closed set. So it could be that uh, there is no causal closure of the physical world. Or I am open to that. And this is one thing. And then there are other forms. So singular determination is in some sense different. So I think that you can have over determination. You could have perhaps non-sufficient causes from a physical world and uh, or even sufficient, and other forms of causation. But I don't see what's wrong with uh, 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 over-determination, causal over-determination, because it depends on the interests you have. Some are relevant and some are not in some context. So it's potentially over-determination, but when you ask a question, you only want to know about one kind of causation. If I ask, the, Andrea, what did you say? And, as, and, and I, that's insulting. And he, you know, a neurophysiologist comes to me with his neurological and says, oh, that's what happened. I don't care. He wants to know why he did that with intentional explanation. So it can be uh, over determination, but not in the concrete cases I'm asking. Okay. So, okay, so this was the last obstacle to our dinner. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you very much, Mario. Thank you.